Another feature in Houdini 18.5 that makes it almost fun to work in simulations is the new Nano VDB GPU solver for Pyro and a few of the Pyro sourcing tools. Let me show you what I'm talking about. First, as always, let's drop down a GeoNode and dive in there. And in here, when I hit tab or right click into the node editor here, going to Pyro, reveals a few new nodes or setups that is. One of which is the Pyro Configure GPU Explosion. So let's click that and drop it down. Let's zoom out a bit here and maybe switch our background to be dark. So hitting D over the viewport here for display settings, going to background and choosing dark as a color scheme, switches this to black. So now let's just hit play. And as you can see, this is a very quick solver. It's real time running on an RTX 2080 here. And that is due to the nano VDB library that SideFX implemented, which was developed by NVIDIA. So let's go over a few of those settings here and a few of the quirks of nano VDB simulations. First, you have to specify a fixed grid size, a fixed volume size here. And in our case, this volume is a bit too low. So let's increase its Y size to say 25. And this also only updates if you're on the first frame and move the volume center up a bit, maybe to 10 units. Let's re-simulate. Okay, that's looking better. And you can see the simulation is looping here. So let's stop this, reset it to frame one. And the culprit can be found under the sourcing tab, where we can set up how many frames are used to source our explosion. So to create the initial volume data that's then used for further simulation, and then a cycle length. That means how many frames the simulation runs before it repeats. In our case, let's set this one to maybe 96. Also, let's set our global animation options to run only 96 frames and let's rerun this. So yeah. Now you can see only one simulation pass happening. This is fully running on the GPU. So if you want to increase this simulation's resolution, what you can do is dial back the voxel size. Before you do that, let's make sure in the display options, again, D over the viewport to set the texture resolution under the texture tab and uncheck limit texture resolution. Houdini treats these viewport volumes as three-dimensional textures and in order to run quicker, it tries to limit their resolution when displaying them just to give you faster feedback. However, as we want to see the detail, let's disable that resolution limit now and dial back our voxel size to 0.05, increasing our voxel count eight times. And you can see now this is running a good bit slower although exhibiting a bit more detail. I'm not sure if I've got enough VRAM for this. Let's just try, but save before we try. So let's try having this resolution again. Now you can see this is the OpenCL error message that we're running out of VRAM. So let's clear this and maybe try something like 0.04, which seems to work. So let's try 0.03, which now doesn't work anymore. So 0.04 is the minimum voxel size I can have on my GPU. Or I could try dialing down the maximum size of my container here in order to save some RAM on the GPU. Just for now, for dialing in this effect, let's back up our voxel size to be 0.1. So rather coarse, but rather fast simulations here. And what I want to point out is the way the explosion is sourced here. That means the way the initial explosion, the initial explosion data is created. That is using the Pyroburst source, which is a new node in Houdini 18.5, which creates this bunch of particles here, which stores, in this case, when you click on burst components, two attributes, one called burn and the other one called temperature, which is then rasterized into a volume here using the volume rasterize, which we already know, which then is being fed into our Pyro solver as initial data. So let's just have a look at this one here, switch on real-time toggle, hit play, and you can see this is just a burst of points scaling up. You can dial in the shape of this burst using the burst shape and burst animation settings here. So for example, the initial size, well, it just scales the overall burst and we can get in a directional vector just telling us in which direction to point this burst, the spread angle, dialing in how much spread apart those initial trails and initial particles are. The roundness dials in how different the lengths of those individual particle trails can be. The number of trailings just controls how many trails, how many individual debris that trail particles you have with the trailing separation driving how many particles each of those debris generates in turn and the trail length, how long the particle trail is with the trailing thickness, how much it spreads apart in a cone shape here. So really, quick way to dial in your overall sourcing here. However, in this case, to set up our rendering, I want to use another technique for sourcing that came with 18.5. So let's go into our pyro nodes here and I want to use the pyro trail. Let's drag that down here. We drop down two nodes, the trail path and the trail source. So let's go over the trail path first. The trail path generates a few animated primitives, those arrows here. 
So when we hit play, we can see they fly along those trajectories. And as you'd expect, the trail path has a really nice set of controls to set up those trajectories, controlling how those individual arrows move here. And I think I might have set my trail length too briefly. So let's increase the trail duration here, something like this. And the trail source takes in those individual animated arrows here. And rather similarly to the pyro burst source generates those individual particle trails, which we can then wire into the volume rasterize attributes to create our initial simulation data. In this case, I don't quite like this kind of fireworky effect this results in here. So I'd rather set my trail path here under the source tab to be a line shape. And I think side effects intended them for mushroom clouds or the likes thereof. So really giant explosions. However, with a bit of tweaking, we can get them to be more like a flamethrowery directed smoke or flame thing. So let's dial this in quickly and I'll just fast forward through this. Yeah, maybe something like this. So let's take this and pipe it into the volume rasterize attributes. And again, this expects those two attributes called temperature and burn. So let's set those up on the trail source here, which hides in the trail components here. And by default is set to generate density. However, we want to generate a temperature, set this to one and add another source attribute here, second tab here, just check create source and set this one to burn. So now if we middle mouse on it, we can see temperature and burn being created. So let's wire this into the volume rasterize attributes here and hit play. And yes, we can see those trails are being created as a volume as well. Okay, all good. Let's highlight our pyro solver and immediately you will see that when I ghost my trail paths, my volume here isn't big enough for the simulation. So in the pyro solver tab, let's maybe increase this to 40 units and decrease the maximum size along X and Z and move this up a bit, maybe like so. All right, let's simulate. And that is some nice flamethrowery dragon fire spit there. However, I want this to be more abstract. So what I'll do is I will head into the pyro solver settings and I'll be tweaking some of the settings found under the solving tab, namely in the shapes tab here, which are the trusty old settings that you know from your pyro solver here. All right, well, let's just tweak them and I'll fast forward through this again. And I kind of like where this is going. Maybe it needs a point light so we can see this a bit better. So let's look at this from the top and just control click on the point light to create a point light at the position we are at. So you can see already a bit of shading and let's place another one right underneath, right below our simulation. Again, control clicking on the point light. And now let's increase those two point lights strength by increasing their exposure to maybe 16. So now we can see we have this smoke plume rising here. Maybe needs a bit more space up here and to the sides. However, what I like to do at this point is switch my solver. So I've got the overall shape dialed in. And now to generate my smoke simulation in its final resolution, I wanna go back in here and switch this solver under the solving advanced tab, make sure my solver is reset and uncheck minimal OpenCL solve, which now means we switched back to Houdini 18's sparse volume solver, which is not as fast as the minimal OpenCL solve, but will A, run sparsely and B, on the CPU, so it can cope with way higher volume resolutions and thus way more detail. So let's dial back our voxel size to say 0.02 and hit simulate. And this will take a while. As you can see here, it's by no means fast, but you will be rewarded with a way more detailed, way more intricate simulation later. And also, let me just stop this here. What you typically want to do at this point when you're simulating in high resolution is you want to attach a file cache to your Pyro Solver here and write out your simulation to disk. Let's just save this and save this to disk. So I interrupted this after about eight minutes of simulation time, which got me to frame 42, I think. And to load up the simulation cache, I already have checked load from disk here. Let's just go to frame 41 and see what we get there, which is this thing here showing a nice amount of detail. So I want to pipe this into the pyro post process. So in the pyro post process, what I can do if I highlight it is I can dial in the look of this volume. In this case, we're using mainly the density. I want to disable the mission here because I want to give this a colorful smoke look. So I could, for example, dial in the smoke's color, which would then show up in the viewport. And you can see that this viewport display is getting sluggish because of the texture resolution. 
So just for now, let's hit D and limit the resolution again. So the display updates a bit faster. Next, what I also can do is increase the density scale to maybe 10. You can see now we're getting a really dense smoke here, really dense fog, or I could increase or decrease the shadow density to make the shadow come through a bit more or less. And admittedly, this is crappy shading here. However, I want to demonstrate that just by creating a matching material here, just by hitting this button, what Houdini does is in the material context, it generates a pyro shader with exactly the same settings as you dialed them in, in your pyro post process. And also in our SOPs here in the OBJ, it assigns this material. However, as we're going to use comma for rendering this, can get rid of this material node here and just attach an out null here, just a null, call this one out underscore smoke. It's just middle mouse on this and we can see we've got a density field, velocity field, temperature and a flame. And what I want to just do is go back to our material context here where this pyro shader has been created automatically. Just copy this and now just go over to Solaris. And here, as always, I'm going to use my SOP import to bring in the geometry I just created, just pointing it to the out underscore smoke here. Zoom out a bit and that's the smoke, it's rising column. Let's assign the material we just copied using a material node, which I'll attach beneath the SOP import, going in there and just pasting the smoke material, the pyro shader that we copied. Next to this, let's attach an environment light by control clicking on this icon here and the camera. I control click on the camera icon. In the environment light, let's just assign an HDR to the texture slot, hiding under the base properties here. So let's just select an HDR. In this case, something I downloaded for free. Let's just make sure we have the camera locked to our viewport so we can zoom in a bit in here, which looks really coarse currently. Let's just switch over to comma and let it crank at it. And you can see this is a really thin smoke looking quite brownish. So let's address those issues and fix a few of those. As always, I want to use a comma render properties node to set up the comma rendering here. Namely, in this case, under the limits tab, I want to increase the volume limit to two. So volume now has GI. We don't need to diffuse reflection or refraction limit here as we're purely rendering a single volume here. So no bounce is needed for that. Let's go into the material library here and check assign to geometry and let's assign the shader that's in here. You could either assign any shader in here, but let's be explicit about this and just select the pyro shader we copied over. And let's assign this to the geometry. In this case, I want to assign this to all geometry primitives as this is only the single volume here. So now you can see those settings in my shader with the increased smoke density transport over nicely and result in this thicker smoke here. Let's increase our dome light intensity to maybe 10 to make the smoke a bit more pronounced. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to use my density to drive the color of the shader here. And although I could create another color volume from the density, there's in my opinion a more elegant way, which consists in hacking this pyro shader. So let's dive into the material library. And on this pyro shader here, let's just right click and go to allow editing of contents, which will open up the shader for us to dive in. I want to zoom in on this area here, which drives the smoke's color, as we can see here. And what it does is it checks if a switched called tint with CD is checked. And if a color volume called CD is present, then it allows the coloring. So let's modify this. And instead of binding, that means importing a color volume called CD here, let's bind a single float called density, which we know is present because we have a density in this smoke field here. But also let's take this density value, this density float and use a ramp parameter node set to RGB and wire this in between the bind and the multiplication node here. What that allows us is to generate a color off of this density value here using this ramp here. So let's get up one level and on the pyro shader itself, let's check tint smoke color with CD while setting the smoke color to white because it's multiplied in our color that we're creating using this ramp. So let's drag this down and down here our ramp has been created. So let's see if that worked and assign a density value of zero, a bluish color, uh -huh, looking good. Then maybe about here, let's assign this a purple, reddish, pinkish color like so, going into a yellow, orangey color, and then into a bright yellow color like this maybe. And that's already looking promising. This might need a few tweaks down here in the color range, position and color wise, as well as in the density scale. Maybe let's make this a bit thicker, a bit more dense by giving it a scale of 20. But overall, that's a starting point from which I'll continue shading and creating this colorful smoke image that you've seen in this video's title. Let's just sum this up. So this is not new in 18.5, but we can hack the pyro shader to give us colors from a density ramp, which is really useful in some circumstances. But also in our standard sub context, we have a few new exciting pyro tools here, namely the Nano VDB GPU solver, which basically allows you to solve low res smoke sims in real time. 
to dial in their general overall shape. And then when you're ready to fully simulate them, switching to more traditional methods of simulation. Also, we've got these new sourcing tools, the trail path, trail source, and pyroburst source, as well as a few new presets. For example, the configure aerial explosion, configure ground explosion, or configure bonfire, which are nice starting points for those types of effects. And if you want to know more about shading, rendering, or shading volumes and the principles behind shading volumes, or just plainly want to support what we're doing, consider becoming a patron of ours, as you will gain access to more in-depth courses and videos. And if you're already supporting us, thanks so much, guys. Without your support, Entagma would not be possible. With a very special thank you going out to important-looking pirates, Patrick Fillion, Chris Hebert, and Rafik Anadol. Thanks so much, guys.